whoever sang that song, it won't be very long. That was not a reference to me. Oh. <laughs> Y'all happy to be here? Yeah. Has God been good to you? Yeah. Don't play with this. God been good to you? Yeah. Took care of you last night? Yes, the night before that? Yes, the night before that? Yes, the night before, before, yes, and before that? Yes, God I'm referring to is the God of heaven that was taking care of you all the week. And even if you don't like the way that your week has turned out, God has saw fit to allow you to make it through. And your being here this afternoon is not because you and God are such good friends, but it's because of the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. That's the God that we serve, and He's a God that's worthy to be praised. Can I tell you how good God is, really? Um, God is so good at what He does. Brother Rochelle, that while we sit in this building, the earth is spinning at 1,100 miles an hour on a third degree tilt. And as we spin on a third degree tilt, 1,100 miles an hour, we travel through orbit at 176,000 miles an hour. And while that's happening, nobody in here is getting dizzy. Amen. God is so good that he knows how to handle his business. Is that right? Is that your God? Amen. Amen. I'm glad to be here with you uh, this afternoon. I'm glad to be here with the West Central Church. Um, I'm looking forward to spending some time with you this week to get to know you. Amen. I know you're preaching. I know some of your brothers that are here. Uh, but I want to get to know some of the people that get to work with you. Uh, so, Brother Rochelle, I thank you for the invitation. I thank you for trusting me to expose me to the people that you serve. Amen. Uh, you know, you can't allow everybody to hear all the voices. Amen. <laughs> we'll get to know each other during the week. So we'll do that because I'm, you know, I want you to get to know me as well. My wife is here with me. Uh, we've been married 25 years. And, uh, and, and we still happy. <laughs> got two grown children. And we still happy. Uh, Brother Justin, you did a wonderful job, man. Uh, you, man I appreciate that. Uh, he was telling me, I asked him, was that your first time? He said, no, that's my second time. What I wanted to tell him, I said, you know, I wanted to tell you that you're off to a really great start because two things happen that I noticed, and, and it's what seasons preachers do, and that is you start talking, and, and even on your second time, uh, Brother Rochelle, Put you on a time limit. He said you got three more minutes. <laughs> and you know you're doing good when they call you on time. <laughs> and the second thing I know that you're on a good start, he gave you three minutes and you ignored that and kept on going. He sure did. He sure did. You all to a good start. <laughs> you're on your way to being sure a whole did. winning person. <laughs> Somebody phone fell, she said. If you give me access to your minds for 24 minutes, I can get this done in 24 minutes. 26 if I tell you a story. All right. In Mark chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 22 through verse 26, and we'll take a thought um, from that narrative. Uh, my wife and I just got back late Wednesday night from a 10-day journey leading a group of 33 people from Israel. Wow. Um, so we got to see a lot of things and experience a lot of things. And one of the beautiful things we, we did this last week on Sunday, we were able to actually have a private moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we had our worship service in the Garden. Wow. Uh, wonderful time, wonderful breakthroughs in our spiritual journey. Uh, but one of the places that we got to visit is a place called Bethsaida. Oh, yeah. uh, Bethsaida is an interesting place. Uh, a lot of sickness and interesting things take place in Bethsaida. Bethsaida, however, is not a place you want to hang out. Right. I'm going to show you that from the narrative. In Mark chapter 8, verse number 22, and they came to Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Watch what happens. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village and after spitting on his eyes and laying hands on him, he asked him, 
do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men. For I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him home saying, this is the cross, do not even enter the village. It's good to see my preaching friends here with us. Uh, this afternoon. Um, I appreciate your support. Uh, but I'm always weary and leery when, when you get ready to preach and there's a house full of preachers. <laughs> because preachers like to second guess and, and anticipate uh, where the preacher's going to go and what he's going to say. And you go pull up this scripture. He's going to say this. And you, you sit back and, because you, you already know where he's going to go. Um, <laughs> Then, you know, if you go have a house full of preachers, then maybe I should sit down and let one of y'all preach. <laughs> In this narrative, as we look at the narrative, go back to the beginning of verse 22, I want to show you something about blindness, but I want to go beyond the concept of blindness. Because there's a blind man in this narrative, but I'm really not after the blindness. I'm really behind, after the story behind the blindness. What I'm, what I'm saying about that is there are possibilities that your eyes can be wide open yeah. and you still can do not see. see. Amen. That you can have, you can be a Christian and still not have peace. Amen. You can be a Christian for a long time and still not embrace everyday joy. Now, follow that. It's possible to be saved in this life for the hereafter and yet be sorrowful in the life right now. Amen. Now, follow that. Yes, the vision that I want to explore with us this afternoon is not about the type of vision that you go to a doctor to see, uh, not an ophthalmologist or optometrist. Um, the most thing, in fact, the miracle that Jesus does most throughout his ministry is, is curing blindness. Amen. Blindness was his specialty. Yeah. You know, out of all the miracles he had done and performed, he healed more blind people than anything. Okay. Throughout, the, throughout the Bible, you're going to see that there's a power in vision. For well, the Bible will say without vision, the people perish. Right. So if they are perishing, you are perishing because you don't have vision. People say, well, Jackson, that's not true because I can see. Well, you might be able to see, but are you seeing clearly? Amen. Oh, Amen. Because without vision, the people perish. You have to be willing to check your vision every now and then. You have to be willing to check your perspective of how you see things because if your perspective is not right, you're going to go down. If you're not willing, I'm trying to give you a reason to listen right. to the story. If you're not willing to change your perspective, you will spiral down. If you're so stubborn that you're going to see things the way that you see things, if you're going to bring that mindset and just be determined to see it that way, that you make up your mind that you already know what there is to know about what you know, then you're going to spiral down unless you're willing to at least evaluate your perspective, your stubbornness will bring you down. Amen. Jesus in this narrative is operating at a time before pharmacists, before optometrists, and, and, and there in Bethsaida are people who are crawling with sicknesses. Yes. Had more sicknesses and diseases than they had names for. Very few people would qualify to be physicians in Jesus' day. And if they were physicians, they were herbalists. Mm -hmm. And follow that? Yeah. So what you have is before we have this, this common system of health care uh -huh. that we have today, and we, you ought to be praying that it does not go away. Amen. Because if health care goes away, then you show sure up will have to live by faith. Amen. <laughs> Listen, in Bethsaida, 
You are separated by your diseases. Lepers live with lepers. Uh, blind people live with blind people, crippled with the cripple, the lame with the lame. And yet in this narrative, we enter an environment. And here comes Jesus, God's pharmacist in the flesh. He comes to Bethsaida. Watch the narrative. There was so much sickness in his day that Jesus could heal somebody every day and still not change the environment. So when you see Jesus healing, get this, he's not after the disease. When Jesus heals, he's not trying to cure the disease. There were so many sick people, he only healed their diseases to make a bigger point. And the bigger point is, is the canvas that he uses to make the point of who he is. He uses the canvas of healing people to give them a living sign that I am a God who's able. Y'all see that? Yeah. Uh, that's why sometimes he'll heal you and you get angry because you want God to heal you the same way he healed him. All God is saying is I'm able. Amen. Y'all follow that? So why is it that over and over again in the Bible you see him healing blind people? You may remember blind Bartimaeus stood by the roadside calling out to him, wanting to get healed. There was a man uh, that Jesus spat and made some, some, some clay and put it on his eyes, go dip in the pool of Siloam. You know, he's after, he's not just after blindness, it's a bigger picture. And he's trying to show All right. the danger of being blind on the inside, mm -hmm. even though you see mm -hmm. on the outside. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. I see people every day. Um, um, we didn't talk, but, but my background, I'm a clinical psychologist by profession, and I see people every day who see clearly on the outside, but are blind on the inside. I see people every day who, who, who want people to love them, but they do things that will push people away and not see what they're doing. I see people all the time who, who want to go up, but they do things that cause them to go down and not see how they're contributing to their own situation. People run away from you, and you have no idea why you can't see it because you think you can see, but you're blind. Ron DMC said, You blind. You can't see. The wrong group. The worst form. The worst form of blindness. It's not blindness in your eyes. It's blindness in your soul. In this narrative, real quick, Jesus uses a unique method to heal this blindness. And it's so loud that, that, that Jesus spat in the man's eyes. Anybody ever been spat on? <laughs> See, it's that reaction. You can say a lot of things to people. But you can do a lot of things. Her. But the idea of somebody spitting on Oh my you, goodness. And here's a blind man. <laughs> he can't see. And, and all you hear is a stranger walking up to you. And the thing, the next thing you hear is. <sighs> <laughs>
some people can get closer to God through music. It's through our singing. Some people have a breakthrough. Some people get a breakthrough through the word. Some people can get a breakthrough through conversations. There's no recipe on healing your blindness. Y'all see that? Watch this. One of the beautiful things in this story is Jesus shows that sometimes healing is progressive. It takes some time. Sometimes one touch doesn't always do it. Right. All right, man. That's right. All right. And the interesting thing is sometimes we will function under a one touch experience perpetrating to be better than we really are. Right. All right. All right. All right. And it's easy to get distracted because you don't want to embarrass the Lord and so when he asks you what do you see you pretend to see better than you really do. <laughs> Jesus comes to Bethsaida. They bring him a blind man. Now going to be something if the man had refused. I'm not going. I don't, I don't need what you're offering. I don't need this. But the man is blind. They brought him to Jesus. Jesus has come to Bethsaida. Mm -hmm. They brought the blind man to Jesus. Watch this. This is what got me. The first thing Jesus does. Jesus just got to Bethsaida. Mm -hmm. They bring him a blind man. Look at the text. The text says when they got him there, the first thing Jesus does is he turns around and takes the man out of Bethsaida. Now, wait a minute. You just got here, Jesus. And why are you leaving? And we got all these people who need to be healed. We just brought you a blind man, and Jesus leaves the blind man right from the place they just brought him. Let me tell you what I'm after. If you're not careful, you get so distracted with the blindness and not see the environment that the man is living in. Mm -hmm. See, if you overlook the environment, right. you go miss this story. Right. This story is not about blindness. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah. See, but a man is blind. I get that. But Jesus is not after blindness. Right. Y'all see that? Yeah. Why does Jesus turn around and walk right out of Bethsaida and he sees this blind man? The text says he leads him out of Bethsaida. Then he heals him. Well, what is Jesus saying? Because Jesus, you just got to Bethsaida. Aren't you the God of Bethsaida? Could you not heal this man in Bethsaida? Mm -hmm. Aren't you the God of the universe? Why do you have to leave in order to heal him? Jesus says, I can heal him where I want to heal him, but I need this man to understand it's, it's, it's his environment that is contributing to his blindness. Could it be possible? Could it be possible that his condition is being fed by his environment. And while you're thinking about that, keep in mind that I, nor Jesus, using this blind man to talk about blindness. Both of us are after a bigger point. All right. Amen. Jesus uses this blind man to send a message about Bethsaida. Amen. I'm using a blind man to send a message about you. And neither one of us are talking about blindness. Now follow that. Mm -hmm. Only using a blind man to make a bigger point to you. Is it possible that Bethsaida is contributing to his disparity? Watch the narrative. Jesus leads him out of Bethsaida. And Jesus says to the man in so many words, we're not even going to start the process of healing until we get you out of where you come from. What is it about Bethsaida that Jesus does not like? 
What is it about this environment? Because even though he goes to Bethsaida, even though he does some work in Bethsaida, even though he spent some time at Bethsaida, Bethsaida is also one of those cities where he casts a curse on them. He says, woe unto Bethsaida. Because they wouldn't receive the power of God, Bethsaida was committed to dysfunction. Amen. Amen. Now follow that. You know some people who are just committed to dysfunction. Right, yeah. That they've been dysfunctional so long that dysfunction has become normal. Yeah. And if you talk to them about their dysfunction, they get angry. Yeah. That's dysfunction. Amen. Amen. And this man comes from an environment that's dysfunctional. What's interesting though, although Bethsaida is dysfunctional, three of the disciples came from Bethsaida. They don't live there, but they came from. You see that? There's a reason they left. Bethsaida. There are some places you just can't stay. Amen. Amen. Let's work through it. Let's work through it. Jesus brings his man outside of Bethsaida. He says, take nothing with you. Jesus says, I'm going to heal you, and what I'm going to heal you with takes nothing. Once I get you away from your environment, Jesus says, I can fix it just like that. Once I get you out of that system that you're accustomed to, I can fix it just like that. Right. Jesus gets him out of that Satan. He spits on the man, and Jesus is saying, my spit is better than the wealth of that Satan. Right. My spit yes. is more powerful and more valuable than the treasures right. in that Satan. Yeah. Another way of saying that God's foolishness oh, yeah. It's more wise than the wisdom of this world. Amen. And here you are trying to have a godly experience in a fleshly world. Amen. So you come on Sundays hoping that what you get on Sunday will last you through Saturday. <laughs> And then you wonder why your world is not changing. Amen, amen. Sometimes amen. you got to be led out of the Satan. Amen. Glory to amen. And sometimes it's going to take a second touch. Amen. Jesus gets the man out of the Satan. Right, right. He gets him out, spits on his eyes. Yeah. Why doesn't the man get angry? Uh -huh. He won't see it. Why isn't he angry? Man, when you've been sick for so long yeah. and you really do want to get out, yes, sir. you don't care what it takes no, sir. to get you. You just simply want to get out. Amen. Let me tell you, see, when people are in real trouble, mm -hmm. I mean real trouble, not, not convenient trouble, real trouble. Right, right. Uh, when we were back in St. Louis, our service started at 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they said, well, Jackson, that's too early. I said, you ain't in trouble. Because yeah. right. when you're in real trouble, it don't matter what time it is. When you're in real trouble, you show up. You shouldn't have had enough trouble. Yeah. Right. <laughs> real trouble. And watch this, watch this. Yeah, you know, you know, people they were parking. They said, "We ain't, we ain't coming because we got to park across the street." <laughs> then we got to walk to the building uh, uh, and plush our star too early. You ain't in trouble. Man, out of 
all the things to see. He determines the depth of his inner healing by what he sees, his perception. I see men like trees walking around. Let me tell you what that says to me. Justin, I can tell how healthy you are in your spiritual walk by your perception. I can tell where you are in the process of healing by how you see people. Sorry, Bridget. Come on. How do you see people? Do you see them like trees? Do you see people as being not trustworthy? Do you see people as folk who are going to use you and abuse you? I can tell where you are in your healing process. I can tell how healthy you are in your spirit on how you see people. I see men like trees. That tells me where you are. Why didn't a man test his eyes on something else? Why use people? Because your perception of people is a reflection of what's going on on the inside of you. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on. Let me give you this. Let me give you this. How you treat yourself is how you see God. How you treat other people is how you feel about God. Now you determine how you feel about God, how you treat people. Come on, preacher. Y'all see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you see? I see me here, like trees walking. However you see them, tells me where you are. Amen. Y'all see that? Amen. Come on, preacher. Let me say this. Why more important? To see what you see, to know what you see. He said, see man like trees. Watch it. Here's the problem. Well, is the problem with the man's eyes? Or is it with his perception? You see that? See, you can have a touch from God and still not have the right perception. Amen. Amen, brother. You can be saved and still not be recovered. Amen. Come on, preacher. That's why, and I don't mean to bother you, uh, but, but that's why it's not a, probably not a good thing to, to, to be saying, uh, don't be unequally yoked uh, with unbelievers and mean it in the sense that if, they don't, if they're not a Christian, then they're not good to marry because the truth of the matter is you can be a Christian and you can be Christian crazy. Amen. Just because you're a Christian don't mean you can, you can be Christian crazy and, and then you say, yeah, but, but I got me a Christian and you still are happy. Amen. Come on, You're all weak. You're all weak. Listen, 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 watch this, watch this. This man makes the decision, has a chance to settle for less. Jesus says, what do you see? He says, Jesus, I'm better, but I'm not whole. Amen. Right. We see. I can see a little bit, yeah. but I want some more. <laughs> I want to be able to see people right. how you see people. Uh -huh. And if you're going to be a disciple Amen. of Jesus, you got to learn how to see Amen. people Amen. the way your teacher Amen. sees people. Amen. I've had some people say, well, Jackson, I want to I want to study with you, I want to talk with you, and, and I want to see things the way that you see things. If you're going to see how your teacher sees, you got to start reading the books that your teacher reads, you got to start hanging out with your teacher, you need to do some lunch or some dinner with your teacher, and you ought to pay for it. You ought to be able to... <laughs> if you're going to see the way your teacher sees, you got to have some conversation. Jesus is talking to the man. How do you see? Watch this. Jesus touched him. But his perspective, his perception is still not right. In other words, that can happen to us. You say, well, Jesus, I'm saved. But I'm still naked. Amen, Bridget. See, you see that? That you've been touched, but I'm still gossiping. 
I've been touched, but I'm still controlling. All right, Richard. All right. I've been touched, but I'm still not whole. I'm better, but I'm not whole. Now, if you walk around seeing men like trees, if you're not careful, you're going to contaminate everything you have. Because you don't have the right perception to move to the next level. Let me tell you Even if you don't have the right perception, I'm done. I'm just talking to you now. Even if you don't have the right perception, here's what's interesting. Look at where he came from. Amen. Look at Bethsaida. Bethsaida is a place you gotta climb out of. Yeah. And if you don't think Bethsaida affected this man's perception, when you live in Bethsaida, you've been through so much stuff. Amen. When you live in Bethsaida, that one touch won't do you. Right, right. You follow me? Okay. Here's the blind man. Now, when you look at other blind men, they all got healed with one touch. Jesus spat on the man, uh, made some clay, put it on his eyes, and dipped one touch. Blind one made us one touch. Why can't you heal other blind people with one touch? And then there's a case where it takes more than one touch. The reason it takes more than one touch for you and not one touch for them is they didn't come from Bethsaida. You did. And there's something about Bethsaida. That takes a while. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you come from Bethsaida, man, uh -oh. you have to be willing to go back yeah. and say, touch me again. Yes, sir. I come from Bethsaida. Yeah. And, and I can see a little bit, but my past is coming back on me. Touch me again. Oh, I can sir. feel my lifestyle coming back on me. Touch me again. I don't want this stuff coming back up on me. Touch me. Amen. Yes, sir. Right. We have some honest people. Some of you come from Bethsaida. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that past keep creeping up. Yeah. yeah, you need another touch. It's all right. It's all right. I like it. It's all right. Says, all right. Look at this man. The man says, I want to be. I got to be. I need to be made whole. All right. He says, so Jesus, do it again. Yeah. Jesus looks at the man. And Jesus says, let me finish what I started. God is saying to somebody, let me finish All right. what I started. Come on. God says, I didn't bring you out of that mess to leave all that mess inside of you. All right. Let me finish yes, sir. what I started. Yeah. Watch this. Now watch the conclusion. When Jesus gets ready to heal him, he doesn't spit on him a second time. I see that? He don't spit a second time. He says, you're so close to being made whole. Look at the text. He says, you're so close to being made whole that I don't have to do everything that I've done before. I don't have to do it all over again. I can finish what I started. But this time, I'm just going to lay my hand on you. Jesus says, you're so close. He says, I know you're close. Because you're honest about where you are. I said, I know you're close. Because you're honest about where you are. The man says, I want to see the way you see. That man says, and so many words to Jesus. He says, What do you see? That man says, Now, Jesus, I'm going to say this, I'm paraphrasing. He says, I see men. But do they look like trees to you? <laughs> he says, Jesus, what I see, I want to verify my sight. Do those men look like trees? When Jesus hears his answer, Jesus now knows where he is. Amen. Jesus says, I'm going to touch you again. Because I need you to see how I see. Amen. 
If you're going to be my disciple, you have to see how I see. It was Elijah that said to Elisha, if you see me when I'm taken, you can have what I have if you see me. Do you see them like trees? Now follow me. He says, I see men like trees. Jesus says, all right, in order for me to finish, I need to lay hands on you one more time. Let me tell you, if you want to see what I see, Jesus says you can have what I have. That's even true with you and me. You want to see how I see. You want to have what I have. Y'all see that? See, see, let me tell you, my power is not that I have more than you. My power is in what I see. The man is made whole. Jesus goes back and touches him again. See, when you're a, when you're a leader, Brother Rochelle, a, a, a leader, a real leader, sees stuff that other folk don't see. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. And sometimes it's frustrating to a leader because a real leader lives between two extremes. You live between a drought and abundance. Come on, come on. And when you tell people what you see, and they say, I don't see it. Come on, preacher. Mm -hmm. You need some folk that'll trust you enough right. to go and take a second look. You remember when Elijah uh, slayed the, the prophets? No, he did. That's right. And he told the young prophet Elisha, he says, go. He said, I hear the sound of abundance rain right. mm -hmm. in my spirit. Here's what he said. It ain't rained for three and a half years. And when he killed the prophets, he says, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. He didn't say a drought. He didn't say little trick is a little mist. He says he goes from a drought to an abundance. But I hear it in my spirit. In other words, you can't see it, but I hear it. What I need you to do Go look right. in the physical right. to verify what I see in my spirit. Right. That young prophet went and looked and came back and said, Elijah, I don't see nothing. <laughs> you don't say it like that, but you get the point. I don't see, I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, he said, go back again. Yeah, yeah. Here's what's beautiful. That's yeah. too low. Uh, the Bible says, when he did that, Elijah sat down yeah. and put his head between his knees. Yeah. Let me yeah. tell you what he's doing. When you put your head between your knees, you try when you get home, or you can even cover your hands, your ears with your hands. What'll happen if you cover your hands with your, your, your ears with your hand or put your head between your knees, you can hear the blood flow yes, in your body. Here's what Elijah is doing. When Elijah put his head between his knees, he says, go look again, put his head between his knees. What he's doing is shutting out outside noise because when you get rid of outside noise, yeah, you can on, hear yeah. better in your spirit. Yeah. I hear the sound on, of an abundance of rain in my spirit. On, Go back again. Go back again. Go back again. He said the man seven times. When you see something that other folk can't see, you need some people who will trust you enough to go back again. Amen. Go back again. And when a man came back the seventh time, he says, man, I hate to disappoint you. He said, all I can see is a cloud the size of a man's hand coming from the sky. Elijah got so excited, he said, it's exactly what we've been waiting for. Because when Elijah knows, if it's a cloud the size of a man's hand waiting up in the sky, by the time that thing gets down here. Now follow me? Elijah says, do you see what I see? Now Jesus says, what do you 
see the difference between you and me. It's not that I'm stronger than you. Right, right, right. Well, I am, but you know, that's I understand that. <laughs> it's not that I'm better than you are. It's not that I have more than you have. The difference between you and me is in what I see. That's all right. My power is in what I see. Well, Jesus says, what do you see? He says, I see men like trees. And I'm walking around. Watch this. Look at verse 25. Then again, I'm done. The second time. I'm done for real, man. Uh, don't, don't, don't do me like this. You're going to hold your hand up, man. I'm done for real. Um, he laid his hands on his eyes. And the Bible says he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. Here's the crux. Verse 26. When he healed that man outside of that Seder, the Bible says in verse 26, he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Let me tell you what he just said. Whatever you do, once you get out of there, Seder, Right, right. You can go anywhere you want to go. Amen. All right now. But don't you go back right. to the sand. All right. Uh, uh. But Jesus has called you out to yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. and healed you outside of the sand. Come on, bro. Uh, uh. Don't you go back Amen. to the sand and expect to survive what's in the sand. It was the sand. That jacked you up in the first place. <laughs> and now when, when Jesus is in Bethsaida and they bring the blind man, the first thing he does, he grabs him by the hand and takes him out right. of Bethsaida. Yeah. Heals him outside and says, now that you see clearly, you can go wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. I've healed you. so much that you want to go back, you ought to be able to say, I can't go back to Bethsaida. God's been too good for me to wander and stumble back in Amen. to Bethsaida. Once you get out, don't you go back. Amen. Don't you go back. Well done. Well done. And if he 
He's huge. When it takes a, a, a one touch, two touch, more than two touches, when you see clearly, yeah. don't you go back. Amen. Don't you go back to Bethsaida. 